Well, good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this uh, Horazis uh, uh, event uh, panel. My name is Paolo von Schirach. I am the, the, have the good fortune of uh, chairing, moderating this panel. I am the president of the Global Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. And with me this afternoon, I have uh, uh, three of our panels, probably panelists. The others hopefully will join us uh, soonest. And in the interest of time, since we don't have a lot of time allocated to us, let's start immediately with a short opening statements, and then and then hopefully we'll have an interesting conversation among the panelists. Madam. That sounds wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. This is great to be here. Um, although I would have pre preferred to be in Portugal um, back in March, I would That's say. That's right. All of us. <laughs> but here yeah. we are. Um, I'm Lyric Hughes-Hale. I am the um, editor-in-chief of EconView, and we publish independent economic information and news um, here in Chicago. And also, um, uh, we, just like everybody else, we have a podcast and we have a newsletter, and we'd be happy to have you join our subscribers. Um, what we try to do is bring a business perspective to academic and policy, uh, uh, policy institute economics, and vice versa. So we're kind of in the cross section. Uh, it's been a long October 1st, I can imagine, for Frank and everybody. I know I started tuning in um, at midnight, and now we're early afternoon here. So in order to keep everybody up, we're at the tail end of the conference um, across the Pacific and across the Atlantic. Um, my plan is to be a contrarian today. Um, I disagree, actually, with the premise of this panel, that a global depression is around the corner. That doesn't have to be. That's not preordained. And in fact, in the United States, we've already come out of the recession. The recession actually only lasted from February until April, and we've emerged from that. Um, otherwise, um, this crisis has probably um, not caused anything, but has accelerated existing trends. And a good thing about this, and a good thing about what happened in 2008, is it prepared the banks for this kind of financial crisis. And it, um, uh, I think, prepared uh, central banks around the world um, to communicate with each other and to act uh, very quickly. So I think on the monetary policy um, uh, end of things, that actually there was great global coordination, and we should be very happy with that. Hopefully, we'll get great fiscal coordination to follow. Um, one of these um, outcomes is that is not just a function of income inequality, but changing climates and the distribu and distribution bottlenecks is malnutrition. Um, during the, the discussion today, we heard that during the same period that a million people died from COVID, nine million people died from malnutrition, and that was twice the expected number. So it is, I think it's in these humanitarian areas that we need to, to do more. And we need more coordinated global management. But when we look what happened on, in terms of healthcare policy globally, we totally failed in leadership. And I don't think it's the, the fault of some of these institutions. They simply, unlike the banks in 2008, never had a stress test before, um, such as they've experienced. The WHO, tremendously underfunded, and I believe it needs to be totally restructured in light of this experience. Hopefully, we can, uh, we can learn from this. We all carry around norms in our thinking, um, the primacy of the nation state, for example, the role of political leadership, um, and the importance of that are just two examples. With so many populist leaders um, who've become the shiny object in our eyes and in the media, um, we just we just don't see that political leadership has actually weakened the role of political leadership. It could be in spite of the debates and all of the attention to the race here in the United States that it doesn't matter so much um, who the president is anymore. And uh, Jerry Baker, I think, met, made that point during the closing remarks of the, of the plenary. What is, so what is important? What really matters? What are the forces that really are making, are changing the world today? And I would say first and foremost is technology. And very few of our leaders, especially our older leaders, I don't think they really understand technology at all. I would, if you ask them 10 questions that 
a first year IT student would know the answers to, I bet they would not. And that is a dangerous knowledge gap. But you see this being played out in the U.S.-China trade war, which is not really a trade war at all. It's a technology competition between big tech in China and big tech in the U.S. So we ban TikTok. They um, uh, uh, start antitrust um, actions against Google in China, which isn't really even in China. So I think this is a battle of the titans and that th we will see more of this and this will increase. The Chinese have um, been very active in interna international institutions, especially over the last 10 years. And right now, one of their, the focuses they have is on creating standards for technology. And I think that's something that we need to really watch. If we create an internet that is actually now bifurcated, a, the new digital divide could be between developed and developed country, developing countries. Um, China is now building out the new internet for um, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, for example. So we need to think about what this might mean in terms of efficiency, in terms of freedom of speech, in, in terms of communications. And I don't think that it's a positive development at all. So um, anyway, that's the trend that I'm looking at most closely. And I think that actually the financial markets and so forth, the strength of corporations, that, that's not what worries me at all. Thank you. Well, many thanks. That's, uh, that's indeed provocative and contrarian, as you, as you anticipated. <laughs> and we need that. Uh, uh, Clyde, what's your, what's your take on this? Please well, introduce yourself. And, uh, well, I was actually going to be the contrarian, but now I've lost that <laughs> problem. Uh, thank you very much, Larry. But... I'm Clyde Huxton. I commonly refer to myself as a recovering academic. Uh, I spent my first career as an academic and then moved into the world of business, really focusing initially on developing innovation, but now more involved in developing investment funds. We and had a, a little bit of an audio, audio issue. I, at least I cannot hear you very well. Is there anything that can be done to, there's a lot of static coming from you. Well, why, why don't you go on to Adele and I'll try and fix some audio here. Okay. So that's our, our technology challenge here. But anyway, <laughs> carry on, please, carry on. If you go on to Adele, uh, I'll try and fix my microphone. Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, yeah. Paolo, I think Chad is suggesting that I take over here while you try to fix his microphone. Okay, carry on. So, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Adel Afuni. By way of background, uh, I'm actually an investment banker and a financial market practitioner. Spent almost 25 years uh, in investment banking and global markets based in London and before that, New York and Paris. I'm also uh, in this group, uh, the one who has spent most of his career, I guess, in emerging markets and developed markets, uh, mostly in the Middle East, uh, but also rest of emerging markets. So uh, the angle I will take today is precisely uh, this, looking at a crisis from the perspective and the angle of the financial markets and their impact mostly on uh, developed markets and how to deal with that. Uh, let me also clarify that even though my title is a former minister, I'm not, and I was never really a politician. Actually, I was called into government, the Lebanese government, in January 2019, from London, where I had been an expatriate for 20 years working in finance, as I said. I was appointed at the time as an independent technocrat, purely for my economic and financial experience, not any political affiliation, at a time where the country was going through a very severe economic crisis. I will spare you the details of my experience of or of Lebanese politics, but we left uh, when the government resigned in January 2020, after a year, and I'm now back to the much less stressful and less treacherous environment of international finance and banking. So, as I said, today I want to talk mostly about the global crisis and the leadership needed to tackle such crises uh, from the particular angle of developing countries and financial markets. 
Uh, I would like to talk about the capital markets, the global financial markets, and their impact on developing economies. Why developing countries are uh, very vulnerable and re are reliant on global markets and uh, very vulnerable to uh, movements in global markets and market speculation and market volatility. And why precisely regulatory supervision, multilateralism, and global coordination are becoming uh, very crucial to protect those developing economies from the shocks and the dire consequences of such vulnerability. Uh, as I said, do you, during my one year stint in the Lebanese government, I had the unfortunate uh, luck of finding myself in a government at a time when my country was facing an already very severe financial and economic and banking crisis and was already sinking towards the abyss. I witnessed firsthand uh, the insurmountable challenges that a developing economy will encounter and that heavy prices that its population is bound to pay for allowing year -long, uh, years long, uh, decades long, uh, actually, structural imbalances and for allowing long series of economic mismanagement and failures from successive governments without any planning or any global intervention or coordination. Uh, th th those failures that I, I am mentioning and that I witnessed firsthand are not only symptomatic of my country, Lebanon. They're symptomatic of many developing countries and emerging markets and emerging market crises. And they are precisely the direct result of major leadership gaps and laissez-faire attitude at the country level, but also of major leadership and coordination gaps at the global and multilateral level with disastrous consequences as we are seeing today in Lebanon, but as we have seen also in many other countries. Uh, maybe in Lebanon we're facing the perfect storm, but uh, honestly, all the failures that I'm witnessing in my country are, uh, again, an example of what I've witnessed in many emerging markets, precisely because of the vulnerability to the financial markets, the over-reliance on the financial markets, the lack of uh, regulatory intervention, and the lack of global coordination that leaves those countries exposed when bubbles burst. And I think today, uh, in many countries, this is the risk that we are witnessing. Uh, structural imbalances in those developed economies, uh, developing economies uh, that are uh, severe, that are still being uh, fed by uh, uh, sometimes speculative uh, bubbles or speculative markets, and that when they burst, uh, will will uh, because of the lack of mar of intervention because of the lack of regulatory control because of the lack of uh, global coordination or because of the lack of leadership at the financial uh, and economic uh, level uh, will will have a very severe impact on the population and on those economies as we've seen in the past I think you're on mute, uh, Paolo. Uh, Clyde, please unmute yourself, and yep. we will mute, we all mute our us, so to give you a better chance of being heard. Okay, is that better, everybody? This is our last echo. Okay, well. Um, as I said, my life now is mainly focused in the world of technology. Uh, I, I actually want to actually tick up on some of the comments which Lurk said. Like, uh, for me, I think at the moment, the true leadership globally is coming from technology. It's not coming from politicians for various reasons. Uh, I think the populist movement has really shown that well, so because there is a chronic lack of understanding of technology throughout the government's part of the All politicians seem to be able to manage to learn what Twitter is. And I think what we're seeing now throughout the world and throughout the bigger tech companies is that they are, they're, they're, they are providing the leadership, which is the world is needing. They're providing the combating poverty, combating uh, climate change, looking at actions around emissions, mainly because they're functioning like a democracy within some of these tech companies where you're seeing more and more the employees of the big tech companies such as Facebook and Google, that their employees are acting as a conscience. Their employees are starting to be activists and starting to push their companies to be able to develop further leadership within the world. 
Uh, and I think one of the big challenges, and I think one of the ways where we do need politics, especially when we need systems in the world, is exactly what Adele says. We need regulation. And I think we've seen it again and again. The challenge with technology companies is if they're not regulated, then they become these institutions which can do really quite harmful things, especially around data, especially around privacy. And I think more and more we're looking in a world where we, we're needing highly regulated tech companies because we're in a vacuum where politicians are not providing leadership, they're not providing that level. And I think a lot of people during this crisis have really expected that it should be something to step up and provide leadership, which just does not happen. Uh, and I think that has really started to break down trust. And I think trust has now started to become more, more down to the individual and more down to the individual decision processes. And finally, we were talking about is this a great depression? Um, I would agree and disagree with Bert. I think this is going to be a depression for those in the lower uh, classes, in the lower lower echelon where they have lost their jobs because they're working in service departments, it's going to be difficult to put on their companies. But, as you said, people who are living in technology seem to be, seem to be largely immune. Banks have been through this before, so they're largely immune. So we're going to see, for me, a two-step depression. One is that there's going to be an underpass, which is already poor, which is going to get poor, and part of the price is going to be harder. For them to get back into the economy, and it becomes the service industries have been decimated throughout the pandemic. So I'll give it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me pursue this a little further, you know, picking up on some of the things all of you have said. Um, uh, you, the, the first step comments were about the fact that, that the central banks had learned from the experience of 2008, right, the financial crisis, and therefore they were prepared to deal with the, with a sudden contraction in economic activities. Certainly, the COVID crisis is probably the first example that I can think of of a government-provoked recession because of uh, public health reasons, right? There's no other example in recent memory, at least, uh, where government said, okay, shut everything down because we need to deal with a pandemic. And, uh, and only, you know, after that, we'll see what happens. And this caused a collapse of economic activities. And so the banks intervened, of course, in a lot of liquidity. Governments launched, you know, incredible uh, relief uh, operations here in the United States overnight, the Congress passed a, a relief package bill of almost three trillion dollars overnight. This is not right. This ha doesn't happen, you know, very frequently. Uh, leaving aside all the other, uh, uh, you know, uh, concerns, but I wanted to also point out to what our good friend from Lebanon is saying: that, you know, poor countries, emerging countries, are really having getting the short end of the stick because they started in this crisis already from a very unenviable position to my knowledge you know africa is in dire straits right now just to mention you know one continent that is constantly you know in trouble and uh, the we don't even know honestly uh, um how the covid crisis is affecting them we don't know they don't have data they don't have data gathering so is there anything that for instance say okay what are we going to do about Africa and its structural problems only made a lot worse by this uh, epic health crisis that they don't even begin to know how to, fo to focus on because they lack <laughs> the most elementary health uh, care infrastructure. What can we do realistically? There's already a queue. I mean, I'm in Washington, D.C., out of the door of the IMF, right? Everybody wants money from the IMF. And the IMF will do whatever it can, you know, it, it, but it's not going to be enough. There's gonna, this is a disaster. What realistically can be done, you know, in, 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 in the world that we, as we know it, considering also what has been pointed out, that we are increasingly in a divided world in which uh, China is trying to exert its own leadership, you know, selectively, so to speak, by becoming a techno leader and, and converting, you know, uh, some countries to adopt its own 
systems and metrics and standards which are different from those and, and sometimes in opposition to those that we thought were going to be of global um, uh, su supported globally. So just to, specifically on this issue of Africa, realistically, what can be done given the resources that are available? Anybody? Uh, I, I, I can maybe just say like today, I think the key message for a lot of those uh, uh, develop, develop, developing or emerging markets is uh, first firefighting. I mean, uh, there are short term solutions that need to be uh, provided because we are in firefighting mode. Uh, as you say, COVID is coming on top of uh, uh, structural imbalances, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that make those economies very vulnerable to uh, financial markets flow and to any uh, systemic shock. And what we're having today is a systemic shock with COVID uh, and, and a drop in demand and a drop in economic activity uh, all over the world. But we also have another uh, shock uh, coming precisely from uh, the uh, financial markets and the fact that they have to deal uh, globally with the situation and the impact on emerging markets is uh, uh, meaningful and the vulnerability of emerging markets is more meaningful. When you have a shock in the financial markets in a deep and liquid and institutional uh, economy like uh, the US, it's very different from when you have a shock that is affecting emerging markets where basically uh, the door is narrow and if everyone is going through the, uh, getting out of the door, uh, the impact on those uh, economies is, is massive. So I think one, we need to firefight, and uh, this is where the IMF and other developmental institutions are important. But the second message for me is really, this is a reminder that as long as we continue or we maintain structural imbalances in those economies and over-reliance on uh, outflow of, of inflow of capital from uh, outside and over-reliance on and, and a creditor to debtor relationship that is basically become over dependent those countries become over dependent on financial flows and sometimes uh, bubbles uh, that are created by speculation pure speculation so unrelated to the real economic uh, value and the real economic situation in those markets so you have like people rushing in to invest in an emerging market in Africa or in, in Latin America or in Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, from all over the world because they have excess liquidity and supply of liquidity. And all of a sudden, uh, excuse my French, when the shit hits the fan, they all come out because anyway, their investment was more of a herd mentality or speculation rather than fundamental uh, 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 approach. So th those imbalances and this over-reliance on em of emerging markets or developed markets on the outside capital markets is making them super vulnerable and exposing their structural imbalances. And I think COVID is reminding us of that. And what we need, and that goes back to the title or the theme, is really uh, to reinvent uh, governance, uh, global governance for uh, leading with crisis, especially for those developing uh, uh, economies, especially with, with regards to speculation on currencies, speculation on uh, debt, uh, speculation on commodities, uh, uh, where financial flows are distorting and affecting uh, severely those economies. So two steps, firefighting first uh, uh, through support, but also uh, rethinking the global, uh, the global order, world order in the, uh, financially, maybe some sort of United Nations uh, equivalent for financial markets. I know it looks too ambitious, but there has to be some governance to control those flows that are hurting massively uh, those poor economies. Yeah, I would agree that I think there is a failure yes. of regulation. I would say that there is actually some countries in Africa which are showing leadership and doing well. I uh, think Rwanda is doing really well at the moment. Rwanda is using, I'm going to bother my point, they're using technology to allow themselves to do better in what's the crisis they have developed their own apps for tracking and they have lots of cases. And I think Africa, if we look at the geopolitical situation in a generation where a lot of the Western countries are going to be facing population crashes and challenges to maintain workforces, Africa is going to be really the, the 
the family brand where you're having still a very young and vibrant population uh, who are going to be developed further and who is going to be able to regulate that further. I think for me there needs to be a regulation because if I was living in a developing country today, I'd be saying, well, do I actually trust these organizations such as I have to have my best judgment I have my back as such? Is there a need for a complete meeting of both the financial institutions, but also as the UN is starting to age, is there a time to rethink these organizations and make them a little bit more better and also look at what are the challenges we are going to face in the next time? Okay. Um, yeah, I'd love to jump in on a, a couple of things. I really, I agree with you that this has been a very um, unbalanced um, uh, crisis in terms of developed and developing economies, for sure, but also in terms of classes within income classes within all of our countries. So people whose income depended on the dec discretionary spending of higher earners, those are the people who've been worst hit. And I think there'll be a massive change in where the, are, are those jobs ever gonna come back? Uh, Disney uh, fired 28,000 people yesterday. Um, are they gonna be rehired or are they gonna all go and work at Amazon now? because of the way that we're shopping differently. I think it's to be definitely to be determined, but it really exposed the, you know, the, this two tier system we have in the U S for sure. Um, this really, um, I think too, in terms of Paolo, what you mentioned at the very beginning, that this is the greatest natural economic experience, uh, experiment of all times. And it was artificial an artificial recession. And what the consequences of that are, are still also to be determined. I think economists will be studying this period for decades and it will be very data rich. Um, we have a group of economists who meet here in Chicago. We met yesterday, of course, on Zoom. And the discussion that we had was focused on productivity. Um, Bob Gordon is one of our members. So naturally we're gonna be looking at that. And um, where is this, you know, are we going to have increasing productivity for white collar workers such as ourselves? Maybe, maybe not, depending if we have children at home. Um, that's that we don't know for sure. But one thing we do understand is that productivity depends on big new ideas. So back to technology and the kind of big ideas that really um, pushed um, productivity forward, like electricity, we don't see those. So there's a law of diminishing returns. In order to get the same productivity gains that we're having right now, we would need to double R&D spending over the next 13 years, and that's not happening. So you need more and more researchers to create less and less productivity gains. So I think in terms of leadership and global coordination, um, those dollars really aren't that much. Now we're getting used to a trillion here and a trillion there. It doesn't seem like that much. I think we need to see in, in, in each country, Australia, for example, um, has an extraordinary low investment in R&D. You know why? But on a, on a, it's the lowest on a per capita basis of any developed country. That Those kind of things need to be changed for us to move forward. So I would look at an R&D, global R&D consortium and a policy response from the IMF and World Bank and others to really um, look at that challenge. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for all that. And uh, uh, again, unfortunately here, time is uh, uh, running out very fast. But let me, let me just point, go, talking about this, R&D, Clearly, uh, the, this COVID uh, uh, pandemic exposed our uh, limitations, right? Uh, we are trying to do a heroic, make a heroic effort, uh, just the timeline of, for development of a new vaccine. Of course, we, we're not there yet, but although there seems to be, you know, encouraging progress uh, um, made uh, on this, uh, on this note. Uh, so in other words, a process that would normally take years, now it's taking months. 
again, we haven't seen a vaccine yet. We don't know if it works, etc. But let's say let's give a, you know a, you know a, the benefit of the doubt to those who are working on it. But you had pointed out at the beginning that uh, the uh, international institution, the the World Health Organization, failed miserably. They failed in uh, uh, alerting the world in uh, what was happening. They were late. They were behind the curve. Whether this was all about manipulation and Chinese influence, let, we'll, we're not going to get into that. But clearly, it, this is just a big lumbering international bureaucracy that is not known for being nimble and flexible and on top of things, you know, in real time. So we need to do better because this thing's unfortunately, although this is a rare event, COVID, it can happen again. At the moment, there is some degree of, uh, it seems, of coordination and and cross-pollination among uh, experts in the epidemiologists in the US, in Europe, in Japan, in Korea, Taiwan, wherever it may be. But we clearly need to upgrade these uh, these structures. Do you think it is, uh, all of you, that it is within our possibilities? Again, I don't want to chase the last crisis when the next one may be completely different. Let's not, you know, let's not even talk about climate change and think the things that are coming uh, with it. But uh, do you think that there is a, a chance of improved, uh, you know, productive cooperation on global health? Keeping in mind that yes, we've got COVID, but millions, you know, hundreds of thousands of people die of malaria in Africa every day, every day. You know, because and malaria is not an incurable disease. You know, there is, you know, it's king. You know, it's not the end of the, it's not like we need to figure this out. So is there a way that uh, on global health, we can do better? Do you see avenues for improved cooperation? Anybody, please. Um, I think this is all dependent on uh, the vaccine. Uh, uh, is the vaccine going to be given equally between countries and people that we share? The larger countries we already are saying they're not going to go with the vaccine. If the vaccine is not, if the rule of the vaccine is not given in a balanced way, I think we're going to have a huge challenge where people say, well, why should I be involved in an international science organization when every single country is being protected? Uh, I think a lot of our governments have been arguing. Since COVID, look how fast and how quick we've been able to mobilize. And this is great because we've been able to inject funds in a quicker and easier way to move quicker. But post COVID, will they go back to that? And do that? And so I think if the war is going to be a scientific R&D, it's going to be a challenge because countries have to be able to. China is being trusted and trusted, and who is going to manage that? I think the government is going to be spending a generation of time to develop this guy, and I'm not sure that we can function on the high level as well. But I do agree with it historically that we need to trust the government really as well as the government to be the company in the main Thank you. Uh, we're still having, unfortunately, some problems with the audio, but uh, anybody else wants to add to this so whether we can have a better cooperation, whether it's governments or the private sector or whoever, or a combination of the two to improve global health management? I, I mean, I, what, what we're witnessing today, whether it's in global health or any other area, is probably a setback for uh, co- global coordination and, and uh, multilateralism at the time where we needed the most. I mean, we see, at least from where I sit, uh, i.e., uh, 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 outside the, 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 
the, the, the power, the big powers, we see mostly a, a competition, rivalry, or sometimes uh, effectively a tension uh, between the big powers as opposed to an effort for coordination or a spirit of multilateralism. So, uh, I mean, I think the, 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 the solution, at least in the near term, will come probably from the private sector and uh, the competition that the private sector uh, uh, will try to uh, uh, have or, or, or is having to uh, improve or to uh, 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 to improve or to come up with solutions and maybe maybe they are more inclined to operate uh, as opposed to uh, the government uh, all over the world. Uh, I think uh, the private sector uh, is probably a better candidate for global coordination and uh, 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 for for, for uh, coming up with uh, solutions of progress. I would agree with that um, completely. It's going to be public-private partnerships, probably not just government or international organizations that do this. Um, but I'm going to make a prediction that um, healthcare research and um, healthcare innovation will have been pulled forward two decades by what has happened during the pandemic. And that we um, will all in the end benefit from this horrible tragedy. Um, but going back to my original remarks, the basis of all health is good nutrition too. And without that aspect of it being addressed, I think there'll be a continual drag on healthcare, especially in developing countries. So I'd like to see, you know, some of that get remedied and really focused on. I think that's an area too. And on the food security panel earlier today, someone mentioned that blockchain um, to manage distribution of food. It's not that we don't have enough food in this world. There should be nobody hungry. It's that it's not distributed correctly. And there are all kinds of issues that our technology could overcome if mm -hmm. we put our minds to it. But so is, is, there, is there a consensus here that, uh, you know, technological innovation and creative uh, public-private partnerships can address some of these matters? But if so, which platform, in other words, who is taking the lead? I can say, you know, as an observer, uh, the only person that I see who has the stature and the experience now in the United States to be a leader in this matters is Bill Gates. Um, again, this is a hope. Oh, okay, Bill Gates again. I mean, come on, can we a little bit more creative? Well, he's been doing this stuff now for decades, and he has. I'm not saying he's necessarily a genius, but at least he has the the global vision to understand the what what is required, and the breadth of effort, and the kind of investments and cooperation. Needless to say, he's the one who alerted about the possibility of a pandemic years ago, and of course, nobody listened to him. Nothing like it never happened. Uh, there's a well publicized. I'm sure everybody watched the TED talk in which he was like a prophet, you know, saying this is this is going to happen and we don't have anything to address it. But be that as it may, do you see other so that we don't rely on one man, which would be really a rather poor inventory? You know, that do we have other leaders in other parts of the world or people who can you know, come together and say, yes, let's. Let's lock arms. Let, let's do something together. Let's try to create these platforms. Let's share knowledge. Let's provide, uh, you know, whether it's the financial tools that can help, uh, um, you know, buttress uh, weak emerging economies. Let's, uh, uh, let's uh, improve health uh, uh, um, um, conditions in emerging countries. Let's improve nutrition and the correlation between nutrition and immunity and health and all that. Do you see the the building blocks of this? Not that we see the, the building, because that's going to take time. But do you see the building blocks? Do you see the, the, a step-by-step -step approach? Do you see something happening, considering, unfortunately, the divisions that, that exist and the mistrust that exists? I mean, China announced that it has a, and Russia announced that they've got a vaccine. Nobody wants to touch them. Why? Because God knows what they're doing, you know? And, and so that's not a precursor for global cooperation when two major countries do their own thing and nobody trusts them. Um, Taiwan, that was extremely successful in blocking 
COVID, but is ostracized because of political reasons. China doesn't want them to be recognized anywhere around the world. And so whatever lessons of experience they may have, you know, to, to bring to the world, uh, they, they cannot do it comfortably because they cannot talk in international fora because they are not, you know, not wanted and, and the Chinese will make sure that they don't speak. Just, this just to mention a few obstacles, but that all these problems notwithstanding, do you think that we will address constructively these matters and that there will be significant progress? One of the one of the participants today is the global the Council on Competitiveness out of DC as well. And I think that group, they are gathering together all the CTOs of all the major companies to discuss this. I think there that's an example of a of a group. Okay. Um, gets together and are talking about all of these issues. So I do think that all the professional group and that um, scientists around the world still continue to talk to each other in spite of the issues even between the U.S. and China. So yeah. that's hopeful. So I think, yeah, I, I think there are groups um, to the scientific publications foster that sort of thing and have meetings that are going on. So I'm hopeful that the, this discussion is gonna, going to have a sense of urgency. I agree, actually. I think uh, there is... Uh this, this is becoming increasingly a uh, bottom-up approach as opposed to a top-down. Yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, grassroots is much more uh, effective and, uh, uh, and and actually successful and has the good the goodwill and the good faith and the energy. While if you look at uh, government, uh, we see more tension, we see uh, leaders who have the vision, uh, sometimes populist or short termist or sometimes literally you don't understand uh, what is at stake. So unfortunately, uh, we are in an era where it looks to me that uh, uh, democracy or major democracy are not producing anymore uh, uh, the leadership uh, that can be inspiring and that uh, effectively what we're seeing is more uh, leadership coming from the grassroots, from the NGOs, from the associations, and this is definitely helped by technology and the development and tech of technology and the spirit that technology has brought in uh, to, to the private sector. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to go back to Eric's point. Um, blockchain is the idea of technology where we're going to be able to have more of a citizen control where citizens can see the transparency of what is going on, both from the science and the clinical trials, but also more and more as we are seeing it, that with the open data version, that the citizens can move up and actually be educated and know what is going on in terms of issues which are happening around the thing. Uh, especially in the local area, within the countries, but also there is going to be a better sense of transparency, which we need at the moment, because the lack of trust, which has been eroded and eroded, lack of trust in corporations, lack of trust in government, government that this needs to be built up, but there has to be built up as a that's what blockchain is, it's a trustless yeah. system, right? Yeah. Indeed. Well, yes, you know, blockchain can create the, you know, relationships that are, uh, can, I say, that can become reliable even, even among strangers. That's the yeah. value proposition, I suppose, of blockchain. I hope that, that that works and that helps. But look, we are really uh, running out of time here, literally. We have less than a minute. So, quickly. Are we positive? Are we leaving this uh, conversation, which I really appreciate everybody's uh, efforts and contribution for? Are we leaving here a little more positive, or, or are we? Or, or is the future bleak? This uh, unled, you know, crisis. Are we? Is the glass half full? Or can we do something? You're negative. <laughs> I think uh, the business side right. from Chicago tells us, you know, that we we can do this. We can we can tackle this. Everybody else. We, are we kind of in agreement that something can be done before yes, we close? Absolutely. absolutely. Yes. All right. Well, well, with that, you know, again, I'm sorry that the conversation was not longer. We have only so much time allocated to us, but I really appreciate uh, your, your your being uh, here and and uh, giving us your thoughts. And thanks to the organizers and Horazis and um, and our good friend. Um, uh, 
uh, anyway, we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. All right. So I guess we're we're still here, but we're out of out of business. This is a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Nice talking to you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're still here, but all alone. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk soon, Clyde. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, sir. Have a good pleasure.